Hello and welcome to chapter 21. In this chapter we will be covering cognitive development in adulthood and remember this spans 40 years, 25 to 65 years of age. All right, let's get started. Well, we're going to return to the issue of intelligence in this chapter and uh, the reason why is that um, if you recall back when we were talking about childhood, the initial conceptions of intelligence really pertain to a child's ability to right now be able to absorb the kinds of information that they're going to be um, presented with in kindergarten or first grade. Like that was the purpose, not to find out whether a person had a stable trait that makes them different from other people, but instead to see whether they had um, the experience that would make them ready for school. Um, when we brought the concept of intelligence testing from France to the United States, the implications that we could maybe figure out who is inherently suitable for certain kinds of careers or things like that, that was a really powerful instinct to you know test people so we would know in advance if they are the right person for um, different kinds of tasks. So it might seem strange that we would talk about intelligence with regard to adults when, when intelligence was initially designed to um, look for temporary individual differences that thought were that were thought to be due to environmental influences but um, at the time that intelligence testing was brought to the united states there was a really big uh, push for a, uh, a way of thinking called eugenics um, it was founded in in england and um, there were some intelligence testers here in the u.s who really believed that there were genetic differences between people and that um, some of them might be tied to race, some of them might ha have to do with um, maybe just different regions of, you know, different countries and things like that. Um, but basically, based on bias, they thought that some people had better, um, you know, qualities that should be carried on into the future, and other people had worse qualities, and those people shouldn't be reproducing and stuff like that. I mean, it was a very awful way of looking at people. And so the idea that people with that kind of mindset that, you know, genetic differences will underlie these big basic things and that those things matter, you can see why they were testing adults. Now, the thing is, it turns out that there are differences between people that persist into adulthood. And so while the impetus for starting intelligence testing was not good, um, the implications have panned out and um, there are individual differences. Now, we talked a little bit about, and I mean individual differences, I'm not, I didn't mean to assert any kind of group differences by saying that I meant literally people vary on um, intelligence. And so um, we talked before about different theories of intelligence. So just to remind you, we talked about Spearman's G back when we talked about childhood. I wanted to break that down a little bit for you. Um, Spearman really thought that intelligence was a trait. It was something that you... Um, inherited more or less of, just like you inherited more or, or less of outgoingness or more or less of moodiness. Like these are just traits um, that are all part of, you know, just how you are. You may have inherited it on your genes or you might have, you know, acquired it through experience. Uh, Spearman wasn't, didn't really care too much which way you got it. He just thought this was something that was durable, um, that you would be able to demonstrate it across different situations because really he thought of G as a basic problem solving capability. And so regardless of what kinds of problems you might be presented with, if you're higher in G, you would be more successful at solving problems than if you were lower in G. Um, so to figure out how much G a person has, we can infer that from their performance on specific types of tests. So there are different kinds of tests. I think a lot of times when people are um, holding really negative attitudes about intelligence testing, I don't think they're aware of all the different ways that intelligence can be tested. Um, so mechanical tests could be indicative of G. So a person who's really good at with motors or uh, electronics or things like that um, would score high on G. Spatial tasks are part of G. You know, knowing where you are in space, um, being able to recognize the relationships between um, different ge geometric shapes. I mean, things like that. Those are all part of spatial. And then, of course, the thing that you tend to think about more, which would be verbal and then mathematical. Those also feed into G. So uh, Spearman had maybe a broader idea of what 
all counted as intelligent behavior that could all feed into this basic problem solving skill. Um, under verbal, there would, there would be things like vocabulary lists or vocabulary definitions. Um, memory tests were part of Spearman's early testing. Reasoning tasks were part of Spearman's early testing. So what Spearman basically argued is that people possess G in varying amounts, and that's what will account for individual differences. Um, you know, some of us have great verbal skills and others of us are not very good with verbal skills, especially writing. Writing is one of those places where we really can see the difference between people or reading and understanding. Um, so on the verbal, it's oftentimes going to be writing and, and, um, and reading comprehension. But, um, and you know that, that some people are better at those things and some people are not. Um, some people are better with mathematical issues and some people are not. And so um, Spearman just argued that this, the, that this might be a trait um, that would be durable across situations and across time for the individual. So it could be due to genes. It could be due to early brain development. Um, he thought it was probably really important that, you know, he didn't know at the time, um, this was, uh, you know, 100 years ago, he didn't really know about synapses and dendrites and all these things that took, you know, microscopes and, and further study to understand. Um, but today we would talk about what he was arguing as, um, you know, the transient exuberance that's shown in early childhood and then the, uh, you know, selective pruning that follows it. That a child who's had more experience and has seen more things may um, preserve more areas of, you know, the brain that was developed during transient exuberance. So early brain development would be really important. Overall health, he thought, could contribute to ultimately the, um, the degree of G that a person would show, um, especially health that may have um, interfered with brain development in childhood. He thought those were really important things. So um, one big question that researchers have had since coming up with the concept of you know, intelligence being a trait is if it's a trait, does it change with age? If it changes with age, it might be due to biological changes and it might be due to in experiential effects. So it's important to understand whether intelligence changes with age. Um, now, early on, the only evidence that we had to really measure change with age was to use cross-sectional designs. If you recall back to the very beginning of this class, the textbook talked about cross-sectional versus longitudinal designs. Cross-sectional designs are the kind where you compare people who are, let's say, today 20 years old to people who today are 40 years old. And you look to see whether there's any difference between them on whatever you're testing. Um, if there is a difference, you would like to be able to attribute that to purely age. Um, now, we know that there are other factors that might make the 20-year-old different from the 40-year-old, but the intent, the, the goal with cross-sectional research is to control for those differences so that the only thing that's left is age to explain the difference between the groups. Well, back in 1914 to 1917, in World War I, the U.S. Army, Army developed some um, aptitude tests. That's a type of intelligence test because they wanted to figure out which of their recruits for World War I might be, um, you know, more or less capable to do mechanical things or to be the bookkeepers or to, you know, the, all the things that need to be done to run a war, right? I don't even know what all jobs there are. Um, so they developed the Army Alpha and the Army Beta test and administered them to all the new recruits. And this was brand new testing. I mean, like this idea of intelligence testing had just been maybe 10 years old at the time that World War II happened. Um, uh, sorry, World War One happened. And so you've got um, this opportunity to kind of test the concept that people might vary um, as adults. Based on these, these tests that were administered to all recruits coming in for World War One who were between the ages of supposedly 18, but apparently some people were younger and lied, but anyway, and then supposedly as old as 40, um, administering them in that setting, they came to the conclusion that IQ peaks between 18 and 25, that the highest scores that they measured were among those recruits who were between 18 and 25 years old, and that after age 25, IQ starts to decline and decline pretty rapidly, according to these tests. Um, a follow-up seven years later in New England um, they studied eight, 19 different villages, <laughs> the inhabitants of 19 different villages administered the Army Alpha and Beta tests, 
And they came to an even starker conclusion that IQ pe pe peaks between 18 and 21 and then begins to a slow decline. Um, they said that the average 55-year-old 50, in their test scored like the average 14-year-old. So that you kind of peak and then you sort of go back down to scores that would look more like what we would expect from children. Now notice that you've got the Army Alpha, which is a test for people who can read, and the Arf, um, Army Beta, which is a test for people who can't read and or can't um, speak English. So they did have different tests for that. So in case you were thinking as I was talking about this, well, I mean, in 1921, you know, a 55 year old may not have as much education or um, be able to read as well. Um, at least as far as the reading part goes, they did have a plan for that. They knew that reading, um, you know, not being able to read would severely hamper you. So they developed the um, test for people who can't read. Now, a lot of the questions are out loud or they're, ver they're visual rather than verbal. All right, so here's a diagram that illustrates what a lot of early testing showed us if you use the cross-sectional method. And in fact, even today, if you administer a, an IQ test to a cross-section of people, you kind of get this impression where intelligence is the highest it's going to be at age 25, and then it's, it's a really steep slope across adulthood to, um, you know, where this is reasoning ability, so it's not comprehensive intelligence, but I mean, it's not looking good for the 81 year old in this picture, right? Um, so remember that these are individual groups of different people who are seven years apart in age. So you've got a group of 25 year olds, a group of 35, 32 year olds and so on. So for a while, you know, for decades, um, psychologists were sort of operating under the assumption that intelligence really does drop off from you know, like young adulthood on you're losing intelligence. Um, but luckily, ultimately, psychologists started doing longitudinal studies. Now, remember with a longitudinal study, you follow the same individuals uh, repeatedly testing them across some amount of time. In this case, what you're looking at in this chart, if you look at the green bar now, you're seeing the results of uh, testing and retesting people when they're 25, then again when they're 32, then again when they're 39, and so on, up until the age of 81. And what you find with longitudinal is what I hope you were already expecting to find about intelligence, which is that it is quite stable. That in fact, it peaks a little bit in midlife, but it's not significantly different from where it started or where it ends up. We do have a little bit of a decline. And in fact, they will talk about this in old age, the idea that um, there is a bit of a terminal decline, right? Before, you know, in the seven years prior to death, you start to see people sort of shutting down. But during the active years and stuff, you don't really see much change in intelligence and, and what change there is tends to be increases. So we tend to see these IQ gains throughout adulthood. Um, so when we see these cross-sectional, you know, dramatic declines, like how do we account for that? Well, one of the biggest explanations is that you may, you know, with every generation, more people are getting more education. So, you know, while your grandparents thought that they were pretty well educated because they had gotten through high school and things like that. You know, here comes along their kids who go at least through community college, let's say. And then here come the you, their grandkids, and, and here you are in college, right? Like with every generation, we're getting like a, on average about two more years of education on average. Um, and so, yeah, education might be a really important factor when seeing these kinds of cross-sectional differences. You know, by the time you're comparing, you know, a, an 81-year-old to a 25-year-old, that's a, that's a couple of generations and probably a significant difference in their degree of education. Improved nutrition. I mean, we can never underestimate how much our brains benefit from having healthy, reliable diets. Um, you know, even just a hundred years ago in the U.S., there were a lot of people who were really seriously living on the brink and, and not like they didn't have good food to eat. They literally didn't, they would run out during the bad time of the year. Like they would literally, literally be running out. Um, and so, and there wasn't the social services and all the things that could help out. And so there are people who, you know, really had sort of, um, malnutrition in childhood, um. We don't see a lot of that in the U.S. anymore. There are a lot of programs and things to avoid those problems because we now know how much that can have an impact on the developing brain and the developing body. So um, we have a lot better nutrition these days, a lot more reliable. We're having smaller family sizes. You know, I, I kind of commented on that earlier about how, you know, maybe problematic for even just maintaining the population. But it also is beneficial to each child in the family because they get more parental investment. 
um, there's a better likelihood that the family can af like literally afford to feed the family and you know that they, the children will have the option of going on for their education and like there's just a lot of things that, that benefit kids of smaller families that kids from bigger families may not get. There, we have fewer infections today like smallpox or polio or other things that used to really affect developing children that today we have vaccines against. And so we no longer have to go through mumps or measles or any of these kinds of things that were typical childhood infections that um, you know, measles could make the children blind. Um, you know, there was just all these things that we don't even think about anymore because um, we've been, we've had vaccinations available for so long that like probably your grandparents don't even remember people who had polio. Um, I was talking to my mom about that and she's, um, I don't know if she wants me to tell you how old she is. I'll just say she's older. And um, she was thinking back on her childhood and whether she knew anybody who had had a polio infection. And she's like, I don't, I don't think so. I don't know anybody. My mom has a, an injured hip from, we're not exactly sure if it was childbirth or congenital, but so she, she's always her whole life had a, a limp because one leg's a little shorter. And she said people would ask her if she had had polio. Uh, but she didn't and she she doesn't know that she knows anybody I mean like that's that's a really entitled place to be for us that you know for two generations three generations ago we would have to find somebody you know we have to go back 80 years to find somebody who might have had a polio infection um, so that's really an important thing for preserving health and um, intelligence now some of the problems with longitudinal just to wrap this up and be honest about it I mean there are problems with longitudinal I mean if you take the intelligence test when you're 25 then again when you're 32 then again when you're 39 by the time you're 81 you may just be like remembering how to answer these questions even if we give you different variations on the test so they aren't exactly the same question you are aware of the style of questions that you're going to be seeing and so you may be doing better just strictly through practice and not through you know overall your intelligence has been preserved across your lifetime we have really high attrition rates in the longitudinal studies which means that people are dropping out and maybe literally dying out and so um, across the lifespan we may be focusing more and more as we get older and older in these um, participants, we may be focusing more and more just on the healthiest members, right? The ones who had the longest lives. And so we might be getting a false impression of how well-preserved intelligence might be in, in your middle and older adulthood, um, because there may be selective attrition of just those people who maybe weren't doing as well. Um, so I nevertheless, with the problems in longitudinal, I choose to put all my eggs in the longitudinal basket, and I am firmly going to cling to the notion that our intelligence is pretty stable across our lifespan and that I am not currently sitting here with half the intelligence I had when I was 25. Like I refuse to accept that. So I hope you'll join me in the denial fest I, I dwell in and I will see you in the next segment. We'll talk a little bit about another technique for collecting data.